Dr. Thane McCullough became the university's 26th president last July when he was elected to this office by our Board of Trustees. A psychologist by discipline, he received his bachelor's degree from Gonzaga University in 1989 and his PhD from Oxford University in 1998. He has served the university in numerous positions over the 20 years since he first started working here, including Assistant Dean of Students, Dean of Finance, Student Financial Resources, Vice President for Administration and Planning, and Interim Academic Vice President. We are fortunate to have as a president a person whose experience allows him to be as comfortable engaging difficult policy issues with our trustees as he is discussing matters of justice with our students. As is his custom, again next fall, he will undoubtedly be found roaming the halls of his old haunt, Catherine Monica Hall, at 7.30 a.m just prior to the arrival of the new freshman class. A 2009 recipient of the Fulcrum Foundation's Champion of Catholic Education Award, his commitment to the project of National Jesuit Higher Education is unwavering. It is fitting that our Board of Trustees has asked him to conclude his inaugural year by giving the commencement address today here at this ceremony. It is now my honor to introduce our speaker and president, Dr. Thane McCullough. Academic Vice President Killen, Dr. Blaze, Trustee and Regent Representatives, Vice Presidents and Deans, members of the faculty, administrators, members of the Jesuit community, distinguished family members and honored guests, and most especially, graduating members of the class of 2011. What an honor it is to be with you on this glorious morning as we together celebrate your momentous achievements. On this special day, let us first take a moment to thank someone who has been very important in each of our lives. On this day, we remember and we celebrate those who are or have been mom to us. I would like to ask all of the mothers here today to please rise and let us recognize you on this Mother's Day. Now, seniors, I have, as the saying goes, some good news and some bad news. Let's start with the good news. Despite the almost irresistible attraction that exists between a university president and a microphone, I do not intend to speak to you for very long this morning. I understand the virtue of this from my own experience. Of all of the graduation speeches I have ever heard, I would have difficulty recalling much of anything that was said at any of them. <laughs> the best news, of course, is this. 
Today is truly a day of which you should be justifiably proud, your university graduation, and we join you in celebrating this moment. This is the last time we will all be together in one place. So if you will indulge me, close your eyes and remember just for a moment a different graduation, your high school graduation. By that point in your life, most of you would have decided that Gonzaga was where you were going to go for college. But do you remember what it was at that point you were looking forward to about being in college? Was it the people you would meet? Or the independence, the freedom of being out all night if you wanted to? Was it the food? Was it the opportunity to learn new concepts in a new environment? Do you remember your hopes, your fears, your expectations? Do you remember your dreams? Everyone has a dream at the beginning of college. And of course, I had one as well. Now, those who know me know that I tend to be fairly private and kind of introverted. So what I'm about to share with you, I'd appreciate if you kept here in this room. <laughs> it's well known that I am myself a proud graduate of Gonzaga University, and I believe that Gonzaga prepared me well. Following my undergraduate work, I did my doctorate at Oxford University, which explains the admittedly snappy, yet distinctively European outfit that I wear today. <laughs> but I assure you, those who knew me in my teen years would not have predicted that I would graduate from college, much less be appointed a college president. I am the product of a sixth generation American middle class family. My earliest years were experienced in an idyllic Southern California childhood filled with orange groves and a groovy beach culture. <laughs> I dreamed of being an astronaut. The economic challenges of the mid-1970s translated into family challenges, and my parents' lives, and thus our lives, became plagued over time with alcoholism and mental illness. Over the course of time, my home deteriorated into a challenging environment filled with fear. As I became a teenager, my fear turned to anger and loathing and rebellion. Unable to cope, my parents did not try to stop me when I left home for the last time at 16. At 17, I lived without a consistent roof over my head, working odd jobs as I could get them. And what was the crowning catastrophic failure of my youth? I managed to get myself kicked out of high school during my senior year. I had no money, no car, no high school diploma, and no means by which to make a real living. Eventually, after many side trips and strange journeys, including a three-year enlistment in the U.S. Army, I found my way to Gonzaga. When I think about those years, I realize that my youth gave me three gifts, which were essential to my survival through this period of redefinition. My faith in a God who was always with me, 
people of character whom I loved, who loved me, and to whom I could look as examples. The capacity to dream. These three elements empowered me to stop focusing on my failure and to start imagining the kind of life I really wanted to live. I allowed myself to dream, and my dreams became the start of a new reality. I have no doubt that along the path of your own lives and your own educational journeys, there have been times of struggle, of frustration, and of failure. Indeed, it is my hope that part of your time at Gonzaga has afforded you not only opportunities to succeed, but opportunities to fail as well. For an important part of the Jesuit educational experience includes building tenacity a resilience of character, and the capacity to cope when one does not succeed. Of course, an appreciation for what it feels like to cope does not by itself create success. The question of whether or not failure is transformative hinges in largest part upon one's capacity to imagine, to be creative, and to dream. That's the good news. Remember that there was also bad news? Here it is. Just when you thought it was all over, all these years of schooling finally at an end, no more papers or theses or final projects, no more exams, well, the bad news is that there is actually a final exam which each of you has left to take. All these years you've spent in school, starting from the very beginning with the show and tell and the naps and the singing and the finger painting, the learning to read and to count by fives backwards, surviving recess with the big kids, Transitioning from grade school to middle school to high school, essays and standardized exams, advanced biology and AP classes, all the way to Nicomachean ethics, Sinopic drawing and Bonfresco, Dorothy Hodgkin and Milton Friedman, the scientific method, choosing a major, Shakespeare and physiology, changing a major, Sigmund Freud and Toni Morrison, heat transfer and differential equations, and all these years of learning about friendship and love, absorbing the deep pain of separation and heartache and loss, enjoying the euphoria of success, acquiring the art of caring for someone who is sick, experiencing the search and the discovery of a deeper, more profound relationship with God, discovering the exhilaration of knowing that someone likes you, and maybe, just maybe, will love you. All this and so much more has prepared you for your final exam. It starts today and it continues every day for the rest of your life. The Roman philosopher Seneca observed, we do not learn for school, but for life. And it is in this sense that you will be answering the key questions of your final exam, not only throughout your life, but with your life. You, distinct from all the people who will graduate from universities this spring, are the graduates of Gonzaga University's class of 2011.
your intellectual gifts, your meaningful accomplishments, the knowledge, skills, and habits of heart and mind you have absorbed, these have earned you the credentials you will today be granted. But these credentials come with strings attached. You are prepared through all the experiences you have had while at Gonzaga to go out and make this world a better and more decent place. To bring together all of your wisdom, all of your experiences, and to lead lives of integrity. To use your imagination and your influence to help the culture heal itself. To rely on your remarkable voices to speak on behalf of those who have no voice. To invest in and allow your faith to be a light shining in the darkness for those who have lost their way. And most of all, to use the power of your imagination not only to dream new realities into being, but to inspire others to dream as well. All along the way, there will be many who judge you. There will be many whose judgment you will actively seek out and whose evaluation and opinion will be important to you. But my own hope is that you realize and remember today and every day that while there are many who will give meaning to your life and whose lives will be made immeasurably better by your own, in the final analysis, it is you who administers your own final exam, today and always. You must and you will evaluate yourself in actions and decisions both small and great as each day you explore the place of greatest meaning that rests between you and God. By the process of discernment, you reflect and you listen carefully to what is emerging from your dreams and what your own inner voice is telling you, and then you act on what you have discovered. Some of you, in fact a great many of you, have a very clear idea about what you plan to do after graduation day. Perhaps you were accepted into that graduate program that you really wanted. Maybe your next step is law school or medical school. Perhaps you've already got that great job lined up or your next chapter will be with the Jesuit Volunteer Corps, or Teach for America, or the Peace Corps. For others of you, the next step may be less clear. Maybe you didn't get into the graduate program you were hoping for, or you haven't landed a job, or your next move is to take some time off and think about options. Regardless of which group you find yourself a part of, I wish for you this day a recognition of one fundamental truth. Today is merely a commemoration of that which already is, namely the recognition of full post-collegiate adulthood and your capacity, your readiness to embrace its challenges. Your, your degree today is a tangible sign that you have got this. You are ready. A wonderful aspect of serving as president of Gonzaga is that I have been, in Jesuit terms, missioned by our provincial to direct the work of this university. In addition to conferring degrees upon you, our gift to each of you this morning is that we mission you, graduating seniors, to go forth and share your many gifts with the world. So at this time, I'd like to ask the graduates to remain seated as I invite all of you gathered with us today 
but in a special way, the faculty members who have guided you in your educational journey to rise. To extend your hand over these graduates as this morning we mission them. And members of family and friends, you're welcome to join us in extending your hands over these graduates as well. To you, beloved graduates of the class of 2011, our wish for you is to live the fullness of life, to appreciate that the journey is as important as the destination, that the trials that we survive do indeed make us stronger, that the risks we take increase not only our chances of success, but our capacity to cope. That facing the unknown allows us to know ourselves more deeply, and that choosing to be fully alive creates more life for everyone around us. On this day, we charge you to go forth and inspire the world, and we ask God's eternal blessing upon each one of you. Amen. Please be seated. My time is nearly up, but before I finish, let me share one more hope I have for you. The people in my life with whom I have been most closely connected are those whom I have known from my undergraduate days at Gonzaga. For years after my own graduation, I kept my commencement program, not only because it had sentimental value and it represented an important achievement in my own life, but because it contained the phone numbers of my closest friends. You see, it dawned on me at graduation that I had better get their numbers because we were all leaving that afternoon. I have a vivid memory of running around at the end of graduation trying to catch up with people before they headed out for the next great adventure. Today, you can tweet each other. <laughs> you can friend each other. You can text each other. You have many ways of keeping connected with one another, and it matters because you never know when along the journey you might need a place to crash. <laughs> or you might need actors for that low-budget independent film that you're going to make. No matter what, I assure you that I and your alumni association will work hard at keeping connected with you. <laughs> Graduating seniors, you have been a gift to us. You inspire us, and we are grateful to have been with you on this part of your journey. We ask that you go forth, graduates, of the class of 2011. And in the words of St. Ignatius of Loyola, go forth and set the world on fire. May God's grace be with you now and forever. Congratulations. Thank you, Dr. McCullough. Each year, the senior class chooses one of its members to speak on its behalf to the commencement audience assembled. This year's senior speaker is Kevin Michael O'Toole. Kevin is the son of Dory and Michael O'Toole. He was raised in Napa, California with his sister Jennifer who will be entering Gonzaga University this coming fall as a freshman. 
Kevin is graduating with a Bachelor of Arts degree in history with a minor in philosophy. He has been the editor-in-chief of Charter, Gonzaga's Journal of Scholarship and Opinion for the last two years, as well as being a columnist and crossword creator for Gonzaga's weekly newspaper, The Bulletin. Kevin has been part of the residence life staff in Campion and Catherine Monica Halls. He has served on the crew for various retreats and as a liturgical minister. When Kevin leaves Gonzaga, he will head to San Francisco, where he has been hired by the executive search firm of Spencer Stewart. Please welcome our student speaker, Kevin Michael O'Toole. President McCullough, members of the boards of trustees and regents, distinguished guests, relieved faculty members on the verge of summer vacation, proud grandparents, nervous parents, bored siblings, <laughs> and of course, the graduating Gonzaga class of 2011. Hi there. Four years is far too short a time to live among such excellent and admirable people. It's been said before, and I agree, that I don't know half as you half as well as I should like, and I like less than half of you half as well as you deserve. <laughs> Good morning, and happy Mother's Day. It's pretty appropriate that this commencement takes place on the very day designated to celebrate the women that made all this possible. You know, in ancient Rome, when a victorious general would return from a campaign, he would parade through the city with his legions marching behind him, dressed in royal purple. Thousands would turn out, the emperor would salute him, garlands would be thrown at his feet, and a harem placed at his disposal. Not bad, I know. But as he rode in a golden chariot, fleeced in precious stones and metals, a commoner would stand behind him, holding a crown of olive leaves perpetually above, but never touching his head, repeating the words, remember, thou art only a man, thou art only a man. Graduating from college is a great accomplishment, and to be sure, each one of us has done a lot of hard work to get to where we now sit and sweat in these robes. But none of us have done this together. We're here today because someone, a parent, grandparent, professor, pastor, coworker, or friend believed in us. We haven't done this alone, and we will never accomplish much of merit or real, or real value in solitude. So thank you to all the aforementioned and the unmentioned. After four years of privileged education here at Gonzaga, we know it's solidarity and not solitude that make life worth it. And though Hobbes and Nietzsche made some pretty compelling arguments for humankind's natural state as solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, Pope Benedict XVI one-upped them in an encyclical in which he boldly argues that the human being is made for gift. Our commencement is a celebration of that gift. Our Jesuit, our Jesuit education is a gift of potentiality to recover an understanding of human nature that flies in the face of so much modern thought and is based in community and echoes the ultimate gift of Christ on the cross. We're here today to celebrate something wonderful and deeply humbling, but this is not necessar necessarily a ticket to success or happiness or security or fulfillment. Sorry to be the letdown amid all the hype. Life isn't going to necessarily change now that we've got a diploma in hand. And if we just cross the stage today, do the grip and grin with the president and all that, we'll each have a ticket to the middle class. And that is a wonderful thing to be sure, a privilege. But if we're not prudent and humble, all the tears of pride and feelings of wild accomplishment may very well mask the fact 
that it doesn't end here. Rather, it begins. We've spent the last four years here, or two or three, as the case may be, reaping far more than just a classroom education. This education has been holistic. We've invested in a passion for quality, a preoccupation with questions of ethics and values, and, overarchingly, other people, and through others, God. Everyone here has experienced joy and pride, as well as failure and heartbreak. We've all made friends, lost friends, grown, and evolved. We've pondered, prayed, wept, laughed, and cheered. We've run the gamut of emotions and been exposed to uncontainable ingenuity and genuine goodness. We've been here attempting to explore and capture the beauty of life. In classes, in church, and through friends, studies and prayer and experience have shown us morality and reason and joy, shadows of the transcendentals Plato is so keen on. An education exploring the, the nature of God and his natural creation have pointed emphatically to the true, the good, and the beautiful, and made apparent the fact that these years at Gonzaga have truly been for discovering God in all things and in all ways. A lot of schools have their students focus purely on one subject, and there's merit in that. However, at Gonzaga, we have been taught to engage any subject, which is important, as the wider world will require of us consideration of every subject. So don't ever let anyone tell you, welcome to the real world. We've been engaging the real world for the last four years, testing our faith, fortitude, standing up for our beliefs, and building relationships and discovering the true, the good, and the beautiful in our studies, spirituality, and selves. And there's nothing more real than that. The trick now, beyond Gonzaga, is to balance the philosophy and theory with the reality and imperfections of the world and each other and still hunt enthusiastically for those transcendentals. Furthermore, that being said, we cannot let these years be the best of our lives. If we do, we will not do this Jesuit $160,000 education justice. And the student loan payments will become like begrudging back payments for a keg that went flat before it could be finished. <laughs> and so here we are, on the precipice of new discovery, armed with what four years of discovery has already afforded us. The goal of Ignatian education is that we are all competent, conscious, and compassionate. We've been through a lot, and here we are, ready to embark on a new path to experience the joy and heartbreak, befuddlement and enlightenment, as fleeting as it may be, all over again. It's frighteningly exciting, and we've all been prepared to combat these realities together. A wise man once told me, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Chances are pretty good that 95% of the people sitting around you are people you will never see again. It's a strange concept, really. You spend four years investing in what you know cannot last. It's beautifully tragic. The friend groups so meticulously cultivated will likely break down and dissipate. We'll lose touch with those we promised ourselves we never would, and we will largely never see those who loved us and laughed at us, those whom we fought and cried with and learned from ever again. The lucky few won't, but the majority will lose touch. With surreal suddenness, and beginning for many even this evening, we will begin to pack up a significant part of our lives in boxes and part ways with awkward farewells, knowing full well that despite some thinly veiled lies, we will never again live and work and play amongst so many good people who have, in one way or another, affected each one of us very deeply. We'll all end up wandering out of here, smile for some photos, and then each one of us will pack whatever it is we've got, cram it into cars and U-Hauls and carry-ons, and leave. 
Whatever plans each one of us have will undoubtedly fail to realize perfectly, be it, be it in relationships, careers, or family. If there's one thing that Gonzaga has taught me, it's that my plan and God's plan for me are oftentimes two very different things. Yates knew what he was talking about when he wrote, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Living comfortably with a holy insecurity is all we very may well have left, and that is okay. It might even be a blessing. So, many years from now, when we're all old and haggard and grouchy, when our best physical attributes have undoubtedly failed us, and we're all nearing what we feel so very far from now, it'll be important to remember who we were when the whole world was at our fingertips. Better yet, if we never abandon the potentiality we have right now for life, we might end up okay. Wide-eyed seems like a particularly insensibly sensible way to approach life. The back of the statue of St. Ignatius in front of Admin, yes, Admin, reads, let your, whole, let your soul hold itself tranquil and peaceful, ready to submit to the action of God. At the end of the day, that's really all we've got. I'll leave you with some thoughts by the farmer Wendell Berry. So friends, every day do something that won't compute. Love the Lord, love the world, work for nothing. Take all that you have and be poor. Love someone who does not deserve it. Denounce the government and embrace the flag. Hope to live in that free republic for which it stands. Give your approval to all that you cannot understand. Praise ignorance. For what man has not encountered, he has not destroyed. Ask the questions that have no answers. Expect the end of the world. Laugh. Laughter is immeasurable. Be joyful, though you've considered all the facts. Since our arrival on campus four years ago, we've all known the core curriculum prerequisite for graduation. Success never was a secret. The truly exciting thing about what lies beyond Gonzaga is that there is no core curriculum. What lies before us is all elective. The possibilities are infinite, and the outcomes of our choices, each uncertain. What the days beyond this one hold is mystery, what we take with us from this place is not. So, be joyful, though you've considered all the facts. Thank you, and congratulations, class of 2011. Thank you, Kevin. During this past senior year at Gonzaga, our students have begun to think in earnest about their futures. They have visited the Career Center, perhaps taken advantage of our GAMP and TREK programs. They have attended job fairs and spoken to potential employers, or they have pledged to serve our country as military officers. Some students will be pursuing an advanced degree right away. They have taken admission tests, filled out applications, and have eagerly and sometimes anxiously waited for the mail to bring them that acceptance letter from graduate law, medical, or dental schools. We know that our students are well prepared for either beginning their careers or continuing their educations, and we wish them every success. However, there is another smaller and very special group of students I would like to recognize. These students have temporarily set aside their plans for more education or moving immediately to the workplace. They have decided to spend the next year and perhaps the next several years serving in a volunteer capacity with organizations such as the Jesuit Volunteer Corps, 
the Teach for America program, Mennonite Central Committee, AmeriCorps, Nos Pequinos Hermanos, the Peace Corps, and many other worthy organizations. I would now like to invite those students who have accepted positions with volunteer organizations to stand and receive our appreciation for their decision to serve those who are most in need. Please stand. Thank you.